Life should be easy. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. We face, well, problems and difficulties and challenges. In fact, around those difficulties, there's usually some conversation, some disputes, some arguing that goes on. The key to finding the potential in a problem is to realize that problems and challenges and difficulties in life are often the birthplace of newness if we allow them to be. So let's look at our passage. I love this passage as a pastor. Here are the disciples. We're at Pentecost. Things are going really great until we get to chapter 6. But as the believers rapidly multiplied, and I can tell you there are problems related to the economy of scale of your life. The bigger your life, I can tell you, the bigger the challenges that you will face. There were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers from the traditional service had a complaint against the Hebrew-speaking believers in contemporary... The old guard speaking believers complained about all the newcomers. The young had a complaint with the old. And the old had a complaint with the young. All the long term Presbyterians and all those new Baptists. <laughs> Do I need to keep going? <laughs> In this case, it had to do with the distribution of food to the widows. They were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Now, what's interesting to me is that all of these great Holy Spirit things are going on in the church. And yes, there were some disputes and disagreements, and yes, there were a few problems. It's interesting to watch how the disciples deal with, well, the problem of the distribution of food and well, as we deal with the problems and the difficulties in life, I, I think it's a model for us of, well, how do we end up with harmony and unity, which I'm always talking about in the church. We need to have harmony and unity in the church, but we also need to have harmony and unity in our marriages and in our, our families and our parenting in our, our places of work and the, the other places that we gather with people, even when things are multiplying in an exponential positive way, we are imperfect people hanging out with other imperfect people in an imperfect world, and that means from time to time, well, we're going to have to look for the potential in the midst of the problems. How do we do that? Number one, I think we have to face the problems of our life openly and not hide from them. A problem well-defined is a problem half-solved, isn't it? it? It is. Now, why do we hide from our problems? Well, that's a whole other message. In fact, that's a, a class and a seminar to hold. I think we can categorize how we hide in two ways. Number one, we deny the reality of the problems that are going on. I, I think the disciples could have just ignored this if they wanted to. 
They could have said, oh, you know, the, the Holy Spirit is doing so much, you know, let's just ignore that there's a problem, a dispute that's going on. Now, denial sometimes is just our out-and-out -out refusal to acknowledge the truth, the truthful reality of our lives. Most of us fall into the second category of denial, and that is, is that we all have blind spots. We all have places in our lives where we just, well, we think and act, have certain attitudes, and we don't really know why we have them, why we act that way, why we feel that way, why we think that way. That's in our blind spot. And sometimes, okay, many times in life, we keep running into that same blind spot to the point that, well, we get some counsel from some other people about how they experience us. We might even go to uh, a counselor or a therapist and say to them, you know, in this area of my life, my life is not going very well and I don't know why. Boy, when I was doing counseling, when somebody said there's a problem and I don't know why, I went job security. That's why I went to school. I'm, I'm supposed to help you with your blind spot. Help you to see yourself the way that other people see you. And denial is one of the reasons we know we have a blind spot because we deny the reality that others experience us differently than, well, we see ourselves. The sibling of denial is rationalization. And rationalization are often those excuses that we give. They're plausible but they're really not a, a true understanding of reality. It's a little bit like, well, why you're late for work? You're late for work, and when you get there, you say, oh, it was awful. I got behind one of those school buses. Have you ever done that in the morning in a hurry? It's awful. I'm from L.A. That's an awful thing. You go, and then you stop. You go and then you stop. I'll tell you what, you only do that twice. And you know what time the bus shows up on your way to work. And yes, you did get behind that bus, but that's not the whole truth about why you were late. You were late because you had a little trouble with your hair. Okay, or polishing your head, one or the other. So okay, you know the guys who are, who are bald in the front are thinkers and the guys who are bald in the back are lovers and the guys who are bald in the front and the back think they're lovers. <laughs> I just threw that in for extra this morning. See, the reason we were really late to work really wasn't the bus, because we know when the bus comes. And we were late, and we knew when we were going to be late that we would probably be behind the bus. So we're rationalizing to ourselves, and we are coming up with a plausible response to our boss. But it is not a true understanding of the reality that we just experienced. Denial and rationalization often get us ducking and hiding from the problems in life instead of openly facing the fact that, you know, this is the reality that God has set before me. And now I have to decide how I'm going to respond from that. The disciples responded accordingly, didn't they? 
They said, oh, okay, there's a problem with the distribution of food. Uh, let's see, how are we going to do this? All right, we went to seminary and took all of these classes, and so we're going to do the teaching of the Bible and the praying, and let's get some deacons out there taking care of the food distribution. So, number two, they had an open discussion about this problem. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They selected seven men who were well respected and full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Last week we ordained uh, elders and deacons. They are people who were selected uh, by the, the nominating committee. And let's see, what was the selection process? One, are they respected? Two, are they full of the Spirit? And three, are they wise in the way that they go about things? Now notice it doesn't say anything about being perfect. It doesn't say you have to be perfect. It just has to... It just says you have to be respected, you have to be led by the Holy Spirit, and you ought to bring some wisdom to the table because we need it. We need it. And where this church is today is all about the leaders that you elect into the leadership of this church. And I can say that we have a habit Picking people who are well respected, who have a, a leading of the Holy Spirit in their life, and they're trying to bring all the wisdom they can to their place, uh, to their ministry area, their job. And that's what the disciples wanted as well. Pick seven, let's give them the job. Now, we know that God leads us through the counsel of other people. You have a problem. If you want, you can try to deal with that problem all on your own. Good luck. Because you're only so smart, as smart as you may be. And when we're really having a problem in life, that's usually when we look around for some other people that we can ask their opinion and observation, glean their wisdom. Proverbs 20:18 make plans by seeking advice. Then 11:14 there is a safety in having many advisors and yes there are. First you have to openly embrace the fact that you have a problem or a difficulty or a challenge in front of you. Then you've got to get some other people around you that can give you good advice. How do you take advantage of the advice that you might glean from someone else? Number one, get around the table and speak positively to one another. Positively to one another. <laughs> Uh, and everything you say, be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Yesterday I did plumbing. I got it all apart. I had my new part. I put it all back together again. It still leaked. Took it all apart put it all back together again, turn the water on, still leaked. Went down, got some Teflon tape, well, maybe some Teflon tape will help. Took it all apart, Teflon tape, put it all back together again, it still leaked. Now the good thing is at this point I have not yet taken the Lord's name in vain. <laughs> we got close but I can honestly tell you I did not, which is good for a preacher to be able to admit. Beacon. I, I, I should have. So I figured, you know, this is really not the right part. And I got the old part out and I 
you know, very scientifically put them next to one another. And no, it was not the same size. So two stores later, I got one that was the same size just to tell you how confident I was that I could pick out the right part. I took the old one and the new one to somebody that knew what they were doing. And I said, do these look the same to you? He says, yep, they look the same to me. I said, good, because if it doesn't work, I'm going to be back here in about 15 minutes. So I went home, and it was already all apart. I put it back together again, and yes, it worked this morning. Woohoo! Have you noticed when you face problems, you don't always talk positively? In an encouraging way? Sometimes it's your spouse, sometimes it's your children, sometimes it's a co-worker, maybe it's somebody else that that's on the same steering committee or board that you're on. First thing we've got to do is talk positively. Second thing we need to do is we need to submit to others around the circle by listening. Now, this is one of the most studied verses in the New Testament over the last couple of decades. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ooh, you want me to do what? Submit to that other person? Now, here's the thing. Some of us find talking very easy, and because talking is very easy, we talk. However, we're not all that good at times at listening. And on the reverse side, there's some people who are very good at listening, but they're not very good at being able to articulate what they're feeling in a certain circumstance. And when we're speaking positively, then we can submit to the other person and we can actually listen to them. Now, speaking and listening become very important for the third component. And the third component is that we're to utilize the different perspective or giftedness of the people around the circle towards the mutual end of the what? Solving or addressing the problem. Now, I had lunch with somebody about nine months ago, ten months ago, and we were talking about some committee work, and he finally looked at me and he says, you know, Scott, you need to understand that I am a square peg. I said, you're a square peg? He goes, yeah, I, I just seem to be the square peg, referring to the fact that committee work was all about roundness. No, no, what you want on your committee is you want just a bunch of round pegs because that's a, a round peg kind of thing. And I looked at him and I said, no, actually that's not true. It's good to have at least one square peg around the table. And you know why? Because the square peg has a different perspective than all the round pegs do. And we want square pegs, triangle pegs, octagon pegs, because when we have some different perspective, even though that may be a little challenging to speak encouragingly and to listen, when we do, I can't tell you the number of times, the solution to the challenge as we've moved forward in life has come from what I would call a, a least likely candidate. Not always the oldest person, not always the most experienced person, not the person who's been the member of the church for 50 years. <laughs> the good news might even come from a Baptist. Who knows? Think about the problems and the challenge of the problems in life. Speak the truth in love. Grow in every way more and more like Christ. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, when we discuss a problem, we really do three things. Very simple things, but important things. One, we list what the options are. 
Then we look at the pros and the cons of each thing listed. And we pick the thing that seems to be the best solution. And we choose that and move out. Do we always pick the perfect thing? No. And I'll tell you why. Because you don't always have perfect. In fact, as I, I like to say, one of the reasons I believe in the Bible is that sometimes when you face a problem, you don't have a good and a bad choice. You just have two bad choices. And as you list and evaluate, you've got to choose the lesser of two evils. And I'll tell you, when you've got to pick the lesser of two evils, you'll be very thankful to have some other voices around the table. In fact, you might embrace wholeheartedly the square peg in your midst because they've got some insight on which of these difficult choices is the best of the two. Now they did one more thing. They prayed for God to bless the outcome of what they had done. Look at verse 6. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them and laid hands on them. That's what we did last week. We, we prayed for those new elders and deacons and we laid hands upon them. Now that's a, a model that we should pray about all of the endeavors in our life. And I know everybody wants to do the sacred secular division. Oh, we pray about the holy things, but we don't necessarily pray about these secular things. And what's great about Jesus is he's the Lord of all. And the interesting thing that we discover as we allow Jesus to be the leader of our life is there actually isn't just a, a holy and, and, a, and a secular, it's all holy And it doesn't matter whether it's church. It doesn't matter whether it's work. It doesn't matter whether it's play. God is the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all. And so we should be willing to pray about everything that's important to us. Now, if it's not important to you, you don't, don't feel like you have to pray about it. As I, I like to say, you know, last night when I was getting my clothes out for this morning, I really didn't need to pray about what color socks to wear. Okay, I have gray pants. Notice I have very matching gray socks. Okay. I didn't have to pray about whether I needed black socks on, purple socks on, although now there's the cool counter socks. They've got stripes and checks and dots and don't worry, I'm going to buy some of those when I go to the store the next time. They're cool. But I can tell you, if that's important to you, then pray about it. Because you can pray about anything and everything, and you can pray about everything and anything. And it may seem to be small to you, but if it's important to you, it's important to God. Paul says, don't worry about anything. Notice the counter to worrying is praying. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything and tell God your needs. Even Jesus invites us. He says, if you give my, my kingdom and my righteousness priority in your life, all of these things will be added unto you. God gives us not only what we need, oftentimes he gives us what we want as well. So we, we commit what we are about. We give God our problem. And to give God your problem means you have to face it openly, you have to discuss it openly, and you need to pray for a, a God solution, a God outcome in your life. 
we can pray about everything and anything. And notice what the final result is. So God's message continued to spread. It continued to spread. You know what's interesting is I started out in a 6,000 member church as a high school pastor. And I've worked in churches as small as 125. And it's interesting, no matter whether it's 6,000 or 125, oftentimes the thing that stops the gospel being spread are the problems, are the disputes, the disagreements, the arguments. And for a church to move forward, it has to have harmony and unity for your marriage to move forward you have to have some harmony and unity for your family to move forward you've got to have some harmony and unity now that doesn't mean you see everything the same way I'm not talking about uniformity and yes sometimes as Christians we have to agree to disagree we do have our own taste some people like chocolate better than strawberry But for our life to move forward in a godly direction, we've got to be able to face and deal with the problems of life. So God's message continued to spread. The numbers of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and even some of the Jewish priests were converted to, I love that verse, I was fortunate enough to go to the premier seminary in all of the United States. And at that institution, I sat around the table drinking coffee with some Ph.D. candidates. They've forgotten more about the Bible than I'll ever know. But it was interesting as we sat there and talked and had our coffee this little voice kind of said to me, you know, I'm not sure if that guy actually knows the God he believes in. This guy could converse in seven different languages. It's not easy to get a PhD in New Testament. It's a lot of hard work. And here was a guy that, well, he knew all sorts of things about the Bible. And as we sipped coffee a few more times, I started asking him questions about whether he really knew the God he believed in. Because not everybody that goes to seminary is there because Jesus is the Lord of their life. They just want to be a professor someplace. And languages come easy to them, so hey, why not teach the Bible? Priests need to be converted. Uh, There are some pastors on this planet that need to be converted. Just because you sleep in a garage, that doesn't make you a car. And the point is, is how do you know whether Jesus is the leader of your life? Well, you know because the Holy Spirit shows up in your life. And where you really want to deny and rationalize the problems of your life, you you say to God, okay, I'll face it. And once we do, and once we get some other people around us who are also good Christian counsel, it's amazing how we find the potential in the problem. Because problems are in the church and in our workplace, and in our families, and in our marriages, and and just in our own inner conversation with ourselves. Once the Holy Spirit shows up, that changes everything. It is the birthplace of newness. So I want to ask you this morning, 
Where could you use a little newness in your life? If you look right in the middle of your problems, that's where you'll find a Holy Spirit potential. Let us pray. Lord, we all face problems and challenges and difficulties in life, and Lord, you know what ours is today. And Lord, you know that really we just as soon hide from all of it and rationalize all of it. Because it's easier to do that than go through the challenge and the hard work and the heartache of facing that openly. So Lord, help us to get beyond that this morning that, that Lord, we might take not only the advice from your word, but the, the wisdom and advice of other Christians, wise Christians who can help us. So Lord, we're, we're praying about the outcome and asking, Lord, that as we commit our way to you, that you would show us the right path, where we should go, that you would point us on the right road that you would lead us as we walk through this life that you've given us. Lord, helping us to receive your blessing and share your blessing with those around us. And we pray in your name. Amen.